So welcome everybody to part two um, of photography today about macro and wide angle. Um, this is what we did last time. Um, what makes a great photo? We talked about beauty, story, um, and surprise, um, and also about how to be ready. So that's what we did last time. Oops, I'm just going to go forward past this. There you go. That's where I wanted to start. Um, so um, just for those people who are new, just to use Zoom, your audio and video is turned off. Um, just like Catherine did earlier, you can raise your hand um, so I can uh, let you say something, but otherwise, just uh, put your questions in the Q&A, preferably. Um, so there's a Q&A. If you look, there's a Q&A where you can uh, write in uh, your questions. And what would be really nice is if you guys could just write questions in the Q&A. So if you have comments, um, you know, whatever, saying hi to somebody or telling me about the sound or anything like that, put that in the chat um, because I need to sort of arrange my screen so I can see everything. And the Q&A is what I have up top so I can see if the questions fit into it. So if you use the Q&A just for questions, please, that would be amazing. Um, yeah, if your sound does go on, then make sure you tune your um, uh, sound uh, more quietly of your computer. Otherwise, we're going to get an echo. Okay, um, I think everybody already knows, but uh, I'm always going to mention it. Inside Divers, travel company. Of course, we're grounded now, but normally we do land-based and live aboard scuba diving trips. Uh, we do specific trips like rec and tech trips like this year hopefully truck lagoon if all goes well we also do free diving and snorkeling trips particularly whales obviously um, and we do photography workshops um, this year that was the first casualty of the virus had to cancel our any Lao workshop um, all of our trips are dive group trips so that means we always dive in a group with a, a group leader um, so somebody like myself or others that are experts in a certain area will make sure that the itinerary is perfect, um, which makes the trip just better than what you can do individually. At least that's what we aim to do. And on all of our trips, you will find that we always focus on education and coaching. So there will be one or two or three talks by your leader or whoever we meet uh, along the way, might be a scientist or something like that. We always want to make sure that we learn something about this environment that we're in. Um, and based on that, because we're not diving now, I started this Insider Academy just for a lack of a better name. Um, we basically have these webinars. They're all now on YouTube. Um, if you're not subscribed yet, do me a favor and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, once I reach uh, 1,000 subscriptions, which is so far away, then I get like more tools and stuff that I can use. So um, uh, if you haven't subscribed, that'd be great if you can do it. And also if you missed any of the sessions or if you only saw half of them, all of them are on there. So uh, go check it out and um, you can see also the non-photography talks we've had so far. Okay, I'm not gonna talk much about myself because I feel like most people know already, but yeah, I'm a photographer and a photo coach. Um, and I've been building sort of this curriculum over the last five years of particularly running trips, but also taking, talking at uh, trade shows. They're going to announce this week's my two talks at ADEX uh, 2020, which is a virtual uh, ADEX this year, obviously, for uh, uh, the difficulties that we have in terms of travel. So um, there's lots of super cool uh, presenters. You obviously know me, but the two talks that I've given there, I haven't put here and I will not put here. So um, if you do want to go visit, they're going to announce it this week, as far as I remember. One is about how to look good underwater and how to make photography models look good underwater. And the other one is about rec photography. Um, you can also book me one-to-one. Uh, -one. So if you'd like to uh, talk about uh, specific topics that you have troubles with or go through your portfolio, or if you need anything help, we can do a Zoom talk where we can work together on whatever, including setup or um, competition preparation, whatever. Just let me know uh, and we'll, we'll fix something up. So this is the slide I showed earlier. So um, this is what we did last week, beauty story and surprising and be ready. So that was a very general approach. Um, today in part two, um, I'm going to talk a bit more about ambient light. So for those who were uh, there last time, there's going to be a little bit of repetition, but I think that's a good thing. And then we're going to uh, go deep into manual mode um, because I feel lots of people 
understand it or not understand it. So um, this is going to be covered here today. Um, then we're going to talk about strobe light, um, artificial light, strobe light, and then uh, different topics of that power and strobe positioning and a couple of other tips. So this is what we're going to cover today. Um, so let's dive right in. I'm going to just repeat this from last time because I find it's very important. The, uh, basically, the essence of photography is light. Without light, there's no photo. Um, and for us, underwater, um, there is always the combination of ambient light and artificial light. And I find that that is where lots of people struggle um, because the two overlap. So let's look at them again. Um, first of all, what you see that is not lit up, so everything that's blue and the dark part of the reef and the diver, that is ambient light. So that is lit up by the sun. Uh, the sun shoots the sun rays towards the subject, it bounces off the subject, reaches our eye, or our camera in this case, and that is ambient light. The things that are lit up, you can see here the soft corals in the Red Sea, are with strobe light, and that is artificial light. The two steps that I strongly recommend is that you always set your ambient light first. I sometimes even turn off my strobes, or I just turn them away or turn them down, whatever is easiest in your setup, but first get your ambient uh, lighting right, then you add your flash. If you do it in that step, you're gonna get much better pictures where both of these lights are properly made use of. So I think I showed this photo as well last time, but it's a good example of showing what the ambient light is. The ambient light is everything that we see is lit from the top. If you look at these fish um, in the back, you can see that there's light on them from the top, that's the sunlight. Um, and so everything that you see in the back is ambient light. And that is what we capture with the camera settings. Whereas every detail on this shark that you can see is brightened up, that is subject lighting that we do with a flash or a strobe. And so if we keep these two things separate, we also get really nice subject separation where the animal pops out of the picture. And when we look, we can see something in the background. We call this the negative space last time. So in the negative space, we can see the structure. We can see the animals. In this case, this is the uh, Bengal Lagoon dive in Fiji, where you know they hang these uh, barrels with uh, chum in there. And you can see that life around uh, in the back. Here's another one from the same dive. That's the same tiger shark. You obviously get parked there in, in one place and you can't move, and that tiger shark kept coming at us from different angles, um, but you can see in both cases coming from the same side, but one picture is dark and one picture is bright, although I haven't changed position. The only thing that's changed is the settings of my camera and maybe a little bit of the strobes. And that is a very important point because you can make use of these settings to create wholesomely completely different pictures. Here's a good example of a picture where this is the Red Sea Brothers Islands. If you've been there, you know at the bottom edges, you've got uh, spots where at early morning you can get the thresher shark. That's 40 meters depth. Um, so that means you're quite deep already. Um, and these thresher sharks only come to this uh, point because that's just about the amount of light that they can handle or that they want to handle. So if you're going to start strobing, they're definitely going to be gone. So it is often a good idea to actually turn off your uh, artificial light because your artificial light only reaches two to three meters. I'm just going to uh, assume, knowing what most people use for strobes, you have to assume that your strobe light does not reach further than two meters. Two meters, yeah. So that's the stretch of your arms. That's two meters. Further, the light will not properly penetrate, which means anything that's further than that is not good to light up with your strobe, which means you should get closer or turn off your strobes. Now, if you got bad visibility or low visibility, like what we have right now in Hong Kong, eight meter vis means that the strobe light is going to reach even less because if we try to get through that bad visibility of the water, all we're going to get is backscatter lit up. So that means if you keep that, just keep that in mind, your two hand stretch um, is the furthest that you want to uh, light up, which means either you have to then turn off your strobes and try to do an ambient light picture only, or you need to get closer. All right, so if you get a photo like this, this was in uh, Sri Lanka, the, in Sri Lanka, the Medufaro in Colombo that we did this year, as my wife there in the picture. And you can see I'm trying to capture here the angle, how this ship is resting on the bottom of the ocean. And, um, and I'm not turning on my strobes at all because I already know I can't light this up. So take this with you that you sometimes make a conscious decision to turn off your strobes. Yeah? And I'm gonna give you a couple of 
things where you can make use of that. For example, when the subjects are too far, okay? So this is here a bunch of manta rays in Komodo and they are at the sea floor, maybe 20 meters. We are at the safety stop. Um, and so obviously they're way too far away. So if I turn off my strobes, I have a nice clean shot. The water is nice and clear and I don't get any particles being lit up. So I made a conscious decision because these subjects are too far away. Equally here, the diver is really, really far away and the bottom of the, uh, uh, this canyon, you don't really want to light up. So just turn your strobes off and focus on getting your camera set to make use of the ambient light as much as possible. This was also from Sri Lanka, my uh, currently favorite photo that I have with the blue whale. Um, and uh, yeah, obviously a animal this size, you cannot light up. Complication also that it's quite hard to snorkel with strobes, but there are solutions. You can mount a single strobe, you can snorkel, but there's no point in trying to light up this animal because it's way too big to light up. Another example are wrecks. If you want to do a photo with a wreck, very good chance if you want to get the perspective in, if you want to get the size in, this is Bikini Atoll, by the way, this is the USS Saratoga, uh, one of the few aircraft carriers in the world that you can dive on, uh, and first class of aircraft carrier, by the way. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you can decide to shoot with a strobe. In this case, I could get these whip corals to light up, but here I'm going more for depth. I want to make sure that you can see that the superstructure is still intact, you can see sort of the, the size of the thing. And so I just turn my strobes off. So make a conscious choice to turn it off. Another good reason to turn off your strobe is if you've got direct sunlight. So this is in Tubataha. Uh, this was a whale shark who was very playful uh, just around us. There was just three of us at that stage at the end of a dive. And I'm very shallow. I'm here at five meters and the whale shark's below me. So I can use the sunlight as a natural strobe and you can get this super nice, even lighting on the back of the, uh, uh, whale shark that you can see here uh, and the strobes would just create more particles being lit up so I can make use of the sun behind me uh, and make a conscious choice to turn off the strobes. Uh, the same whale shark, same situation, maybe that was before, I think I made a different order, uh, but it was the same whale shark. This is against the sunlight. So here I am shooting right in the sun and the whale shark is blocking the sun and we get a silhouette effect. Totally opposite of this. When you look at these two, you can already imagine that these have to change settings. The camera has to be in a completely different setting. And that is what I'd like to distill into you is that you try to always make an active conscious choice on what you tell your camera to do. Because if you're shooting with ambulance only, you need to think about what you're trying to achieve. What is the stylistic effect? I find very often when we have the strobes, we just you know, shoot light at the subject and hope for the best. Whereas if we think about it, what are we going to do? Are we going to, you know, use the shadows? Are we going to, you know, there's different things that we can work with. Um, this is the sunlight. Is it a reflection? Is it light coming in somewhere? There's lots of things you can think about to make a picture different. Every picture can be different depending on how you set it. Um, and you just use your camera to set how much of the ambient light that you want to get. So you need to plan your angle. So if you shoot against the sunlight, it's totally different than when the sunlight is behind you. So you can see this photo. I don't know if you've ever had the chance to swim with a pilot well. Um, this was my first time. I was very lucky. I was uh, invited by a photographer to join him on, uh, uh, on this trip. And I was super excited about this photo because, you know, I've got the pilot well, I've got the reflection, it's nice and blue. But if you look at it, the really important part is the face and the eye and the sun is not shining at that. And if you remember what I, what I said last time, what I find super important to avoid are so-called ass shots. Um, uh, because here, if you look at the biggest detail that we have is actually the lower part of uh, the body and not the front part. So this photo, the next one, okay, there's a lot happening in here as well, but here you can see the sunlight is now behind me and it's shining onto the front of the pilot wells. Also, they're looking at me, that's super lucky. And by the way, in case you didn't notice, there's also a pot of dolphins that are swimming along. So we got spinner dolphins and pilot whales all in one picture. Um, but that aside, if you just look at the face of the pilot whale, you can see that the sunlight is in its face. And that is much better because now we have much more detail. So if you can, you need to plan your angle of your light. And so when we were in Sri Lanka and the 
guys were just throwing us in the water uh, to swim with the blue whales, I started telling them that I would rather be on the other side of the whale because that's where the sunlight is. Because all you get otherwise is this black, huge silhouette. So you need to think about where your sunlight is coming from. Here, okay, today, I don't know, I have lots of examples from Sri Lanka. This is uh, one of the really cool wrecks uh, in front of Colombia. This is a World War I wreck, the SS Perseus. And this picture, I could have also lit up the corals in the front. My strobes would probably reach that. But it's much better as an ambient light photo because, as you can tell, the sunlight is coming from the top right. So the detail is actually really nicely lit up. And so we do not need a strobe um, to create a different kind of picture. Here, this is a, a hammerhead, and you can see that the light's coming from the top left, and that actually worked out all right. I didn't strobe, because generally when we see hammerheads, I generally ask people not to use strobe light on the first passing, because very likely they were not gonna come back. Um, if you have hammerheads that are coming around, uh, by all means, but otherwise you don't wanna use a strobe. So I didn't use a strobe um, to be a good example, and actually the picture turned out really nice. We had shadow and light, and the light is still lighting up uh, um, the, the body and the hammer comes out as a silhouette, which turns out really, really nice. Glad I didn't turn on the strobes here. And then there are lots of shots that you might want to do against the sunlight, where again, the strobe is no use, way too big. This, uh, uh, this is um, a school of Barracuda in uh, Banda C. And, you know, it, it is much better to work with the camera to make this a ambient light shot. Here we've got two different kinds of ambient light and the diver is actually in the one shadow area. This is uh, blue holes in Palau. Um, and you can see that the light that's coming from the outside is different from the light that's coming from the top light. Uh, it's in a way stronger. And so getting these two lights to work and then getting the diver to get his mask in the right angle, that all came together. And then you've got a very, very nice ambient light photograph, at least in my opinion. So what I'm trying to say here is actively plan your shots, think about the light that you have and work with that and try to really change your settings for every photo. Um, sometimes I feel people just take the camera and just shoot, 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 shoot. But that means all your photos are gonna be best case equal, but in most cases, they're actually gonna deteriorate over the course of your trip because sometimes you shoot shallow, sometimes you shoot deep and you're not changing your settings. So make sure you change the settings for every photo. And here we come to a very important uh, thing that you should all be doing, which is shooting in manual mode. Um, I hope that's what everybody is already doing. But if not, then uh, please start doing that. And obviously I already gave you my biggest secret last time is the secret of the test shot. Test your settings before you get to the subject. You can use it on your hand, or if you're not shooting with a strobe, you can just shoot reef, but do it in the right angle. So how do we change ambient light? We do it with manual mode, or you mentioned. So we're gonna now spend some time on camera basics. So uh, if this is a repetition for people, I, I really am um, um, sorry, uh, but uh, I need to go through this at this stage. Uh, please interrupt me if you have any questions to this. I just uh, saw that my Q&A went away. Uh, Paul, I'll, uh, I have some photos where I have the settings mentioned, but um, I'll point it out uh, as we go. Now that we're going more in detail, I'm gonna tell you more about the settings that I'm using. So auto mode, yeah, uh, all of our cameras are extremely smart and they can do automatic mode, which means the camera decides everything for you. That demands that you have no influence on the ambient light. And in a way, you don't really have an influence on anything because all you can do is framing. And a big problem is that the camera doesn't know that you're underwater. So it doesn't know that the light that it reaches uh, that reaches the sensor is not the same like an above water lighting. So the camera deciding on what kind of picture you're going to take is kind of beyond the point because it doesn't know what, what it's dealing with. Um, the other thing, it doesn't know what kind of sort of possibilities you have underwater, what kind of things you can do, right? Um, so um, uh, a, a really big problem uh, that we have when we use auto mode is that the camera assumes when a strobe is connected that a single flash is connected, a strobe is connected. But it's not aware that we might have two and they would be shining from the sides and not from the top. So it would be totally misleading to uh, actually assume that the camera is smart enough to get that. Daryl is asking if I'm covering compact cameras. Yes, I am. You can shoot 
uh, uh, with a compact camera in manual mode as well. And I'm going to make I'm going to point out some differences between the two as well. Um, Afa is asking if um, TG5, because that's what you have, right? TG5 is uh, is okay to use. The thing is, the manual mode that the TG6 has is still not very strong, and that's why that's literally the main reason why I'm not a fan of the TGs. The sorry, the Olympus Tough. In case you don't know this camera, it's the most popular underwater camera because it's the easiest. It's unbreakable. Um, it's very lightweight. It's a great camera, but um, if I and me have been sparring on this for many years, I, I don't like this camera because it doesn't have manual mode in a way that you can make use of it. Now they do have manual mode since the TG5, um, and they even have a sort of a raw format, but it's not enough that allows you to do your full creativity that you could do with, uh, for example, a G16 like Daryl has, or any of the G7 uh, series, the Panasonic LX100 or the LX10 um, or the RX100. There, you've got a manual mode, and you can make use of what the camera gives you. Now, people often ask me if um, uh, you know the end underwater mode of the camera is good enough. The answer is no, because it's still an auto mode. All that an underwater mode does, so the Canon compacts and the Sony compacts and the TGs, they all have underwater modes. But that all it does is a white balance change. So it changes it to red, um, and that's it. And that doesn't really uh, do us any favors when we try to implement manual mode um, approach. So let's go to manual mode. We're going to switch here with our big dial over to M in manual mode. And now suddenly the human decides everything. Um, and the human makes also all mistakes, which is what's the most frustrating part. But now we suddenly have a whole bouquet of lighting options that we can make use of. And now the only problem is that you need to know what's available so that you can make use of it perfectly. And this is what I'm going to intend to do for the next sort of 20 minutes. So this is the uh, famous holy trinity of uh, uh, photography. So aperture, shutter speed, and ISO are the three ways on how you can control the amount of light that goes in the camera. On the right is a graph of a mirror reflex camera. Uh, SLR, right? And so here uh, you can see the three are indicated in color. Now in other other cameras, such as mirrorless, it is different. It goes with a shutter that's in front of the sensor um, that you can see here in purple and the reflex, so the mirror here isn't there, but essentially it's still the same thing. Even in the TG, it's the same thing. We still have these three uh, ways of implementing how much light is going in and they influence each other. However, if you've been to my previous talk or one of my trips, you know that I like to see it more like a pyramid. I like to call this the pyramid of light, trademark pending. Um, and uh, this is essentially, uh, I'm going to explain why I put it in a hierarchy, but essentially I feel that each of these settings you can use less. I'm trying to make it easier with, for you to change the settings by putting them in a priority list. And that is essentially what this is, and I'll explain that over the next minutes. So here is a nice graph that I borrowed from uh, uh, a page, um, SLR uh, F-Stop Pros, I think they're called. Um, and essentially, you can see what the different parts are. So one is the sensitivity of the sensor, which decides generally how bright the situation is. The next one is the shutter speed, which dec decides how long are you taking a picture for. And the aperture is how much light are you letting in at that time? Don't worry, I'm going to go into more detail, but that is the simple structure. So let's start with ISO. ISO is a, uh, uh, a standard that was used in film. So back in the days when we had film, we had to, just, we had to buy these little film uh, rolls, and we had to decide what ISO we're going to be using. And common was 100, 200, 400. And for the crazy ones, there was 800 and maybe 1,600. And those you would use for certain lighting conditions. So if you had a sunny day, you would use your 100s. And if you had a dark overcast day, you would use your ISO 400s. Now, if you didn't shoot all 36 picture in a day, then the next day was different. Well, then you had a problem, right? Or often you even had the problem when the sun started setting and suddenly your ISO 100 was too dark. So this was the problem that we used to have with film. Today, 
this ISO terminology is being used for the sensitivity of the sensor. It is not the same. We can change it all the time. In fact, I change it every dive. Um, so it is a great uh, uh, a way to change the overall brightness of your picture. But it changes the overall brightness of everything, and it comes with two problems. One is we only can use a certain amount of the, uh, of the ISO tools because they create grain. So this is an example I took from the same page. But all you guys know is when you take your photos, uh, very often when you look into the details, it is grainy. That is because if you've got flat surfaces uh, or, or, or surfaces that don't have any structure, it is even easier to see the noise. Um, and, uh, and so we are limited to basically ISO 400 in most cases. The other thing is if you create a too bright scenario, a too bright situation, this is here where I came out of a wreck in Palau and I was in the belly of the wreck, I was trying to shoot with ambient light and I came out to the mast where we do our safety stop and it was way too bright. So you can see that if I'm shooting the same picture with ISO 500 and I tune it down to ISO 100, the whole picture changes. And the important thing that you want to look at is the light bleed. You want to see if the light is bleeding. You can see here in the second picture, I can already see the structure of the reef. But if you look in detail, if you, if you look at these areas here, you can see the light is still bleeding over the details. So what you want to achieve is this where the light doesn't spill over your subjects anymore, then your ISO is in the right area. Um, obviously, you can do that with aperture and shutter speed as well, but I find that with the ISO, if you've got a picture like the one on the left, it shows you that you're overall way too bright, and instead of fine-tuning, you need to make some big steps, and that's what your ISO is for. So how do you know if your ISO is correct? Well, that's it's not a uh, science. It's a little bit of a feeling. So you do need to uh, uh, have a good look at it. But essentially, when the photo is way too dark or way too bright, that's when you want to use your ISO. And particularly, if you start playing with your other two dials, your aperture and your shutter speed, and you can't really get a nice contrast. So what I had here in the uh, picture earlier, um, sorry, uh, in your picture earlier, on the right side, you have nice contrast. So the subject is separating strongly from the background, then you have the right ISO, and then you can do the fine tune with upper, aperture and shutter speed. So as a general measure, if you got a bright sunny day and you're in shallow water, then ISO 125 to 250 is good. If it's overcast, um, depending on your camera, 320, 400. For me, I've got the D850, which is you know top end of, of Nikon cameras, and that camera already starts creating quite some noise at 500. Unfortunately, uh, the camera gives me, I think, 128,000 ISO, but for underwater, it's not pretty. So unless it's a really, really uh, a, a situation where I would be um, you know, sad if I couldn't take the picture because it's so dark and I just want to capture it somehow, unless I want to do that, for nice pictures, I'm always going to try to stay 400 or, um, uh, or below. Um, so, yeah. Um, for some newer cameras, I saw that the A7 does really well up to ISO 800. Um, and so there you have that option, perhaps. Uh, Manjula, uh, G7X Mark II, I would say no higher than 400. Take a picture in the blue with ISO uh, 640, and you'll see it is grainy already. If you've got no other option, or by all means, but generally you want to stay away from anything above 400. Even if I can, I will stay away from 400. The lower you go, the better. So um, that is kind of the, uh, the approach. One thing that's important, folks, is that when you're close to the surface, make sure that you, um, make sure that you shoot with a low ISO, right? Because the, uh, the, uh, at the surface, we've got the situation that the light breaks through the surface and creates very bright sparkles. And if you've got a high ISO, what you're gonna get is quite blurry photos that you can't edit. Once a picture is really white, there's no picture information, it's 255 and uh, you can't change anything, any pixels anymore. So that's why when you're close to the surface, you wanna, always wanna shoot um, um, with lower ISO. Uh, Robbie is asking Canon Mark IV, Mark IV of which camera? 5D Mark IV? You can definitely shoot to 400. Um, but I would also, same like the D850, I would stay away from the 500 unless you have to. 
Okay, um, let's go to the next part. Um, ISO, I think it's pretty easy. Uh, shutter speed is already a bit harder. And one thing that I find also for myself for many years was complicated was that you've got an intended effect, a primary effect of the shutter and the aperture, and you've got a secondary effect or a lighting effect. So I will try to explain both of those and later I will come to a, a scenario where I'm trying to explain how you can make use of either the primary or the secondary effect. So the primary effect is in shutter speed, speed control. So this is how we uh, determine how much picture information comes in and does the motion of the picture come in. So here you've got an extreme example of a, uh, a slow shutter speed picture that where I turn the camera and this is shot at 1 20th. And therefore you can see that everything that's not lit up by the strobe is therefore in motion. But normally shutter speed is for two specific things. One is to freeze motion. Now here on the left, you see a humpback whale uh, flipping on his back. Um, this I'm shooting with one two thousandths uh, of a second. So this is one second divided by two thousand. That is just fast enough to make the, the little uh, uh, droplets freeze in midair. If you shoot this at one five hundred, it's all gonna be blurry. That is the primary effect for shutter speed because we got to remember photos, our cameras are made for above water, not below water. The second thing that the shutter speed is taking care of is our hand motion. So as soon as we start taking pictures where the shutter speed is slower than 1 30th and many people even 1 60th, already our hand motion creates a, a ripple effect that makes the picture not sharp, which is why when you take an evening picture, you need to use a tripod because you can't hold the camera steady. And so essentially the shutter speed primary effect is to decide how do we freeze motion. And motion blur is actually an artistic use of a negative side effect of shutter speed. So the real effect is to make sure your motion is frozen. Here's an example um, in case you didn't know what the one was. The one stands for one second and the number is divided by. So here we've got the situation that the fast or the higher the number, the faster the speed. So uh, if you've got a fast running uh, person like here in the top left, then you need one five hundredth. And if you would take the same picture with a half a second, so one divided by two in the bottom right hand corner, you would get a motion blur because in the moment where the camera is opening, the subject is moving and close the camera closes and has captured the motion. Robbie, we'll get to the secondary effect in a moment. So we've got the primary effect that is to freeze the motion. Here is the artistic effect. This is also from one of these websites is where you can see if you shoot it at uh, four seconds, you get these lighting trails because the, uh, the, the Ferris wheel has light sources that are gonna paint themselves into your picture if you shoot at slow shutter. But you can also see that when you shoot at one, uh, 120th, you can see still that the motion is not sharp. It is still blurry and there's still movement in there because a Ferris wheel is moving too fast. So what does it do for us underwater? So generally, we might want to always try to get a sharp picture of an, uh, an animal. That's what we thrive, right? And so if you want to shoot a shark or a manta ray or any fish, generally you're best off if you shoot at 1 200th or 1 250th. Um, if you want to create a motion blur, which I'm only going to cover a little bit today, I'm going to talk a lot more about this in the wide angle session, part four. Um, but if you want to create a motion blur, you want to be shooting less than 1 60th, because then you have the chance that the, the subject will move in the picture while you're taking a photo. You can also do this in macro. So this is a picture of a, a, a juvenile sweet lip. I took forever to try to get this photo, but essentially I'm shooting this here at 1 20th, which is a good one if you want to play with slow shutter speed. Um, and, uh, and it's also cropped a little bit. Um, and then we can get this really cool wiggle motion that, the, uh, that these animals do to uh, distract predators. Now we come to uh, Rabi's uh, question or the point that you po pointed out is that the shorter the shutter speed, so the faster 
the subject and the shorter we uh, allow the camera to be open, the less light actually enters the camera. So if this here is my uh, opening of the camera and my closing, so if I only close it for a moment, less light will come through. So the secondary effect or lighting effect is therefore the faster the shutter speed, so the higher the, the, the number, the less light do we get in. So this is the secondary effect, which means if we want to get more light into the picture and we want to use shutter speed to do so, we need to uh, reduce the shutter speed towards 1 30th, right? And you can see, I'll try to make this visual here with these uh, yellow blobs, that this is the amount of light that you're getting. Um, now, you might wonder why your camera always stops you at 1 250th or somewhere about there. My camera actually doesn't stop me. I can keep going. But you will see that at 1 400th, unless you've got certain uh, compact cameras, you actually will get a shutter that is coming up. There's now actually a new strobe on the market, the new Ccam flash that will allow you to shoot up to 1 2000th. But that is a very expensive strobe. I think it's 2400 US dollars. Um, a piece, uh, but then you can avoid this uh, mirror catch-up. What happens here is essentially the mirror is on the way back up while the, the, the strobe is still lighting up. So that's uh, essentially what's happening here. So that's why your range that you can play with is generally limited to 1 2 50th. If you've got an older mirrorless, it might even be 1 1 60th or 1 200th. So that is the game that you can play with, right? Now, there's a big difference between macro and wide because in macro, we've got slow subjects. And in uh, wide angle, we generally work with faster subjects, fish or an eagle ray like here. And therefore, we've got actually much more range of shutter speed that we can use in macro than in wide angle. Because in wide angle, we've got no choice. If we want this eagle ray to look good, we're going to have to shoot them at 1 2 50th. But this snail and the emperor shrimp is not going to be any different if we shoot it with 1 60th or 1 250th. The reason we limit it to 1 60th is because that's already where your, car, your handshake starts to make an influence. You can try shooting at 1 30th, but I'll show you later what happens there. So for the shutter speed, um, I generally recommend that if you're shooting wide, you want to be, if it's just the reef scape and no fish, then you can go all the way down to 1 60th. But generally, if I'm on the reef, I always shoot with 1 200th or more. Because the faster it is, the more frozen the picture is, and the better your details will look. Particularly little fish that swim around in the background will be much sharper if you shoot with 1 200th. If you want to create a motion blur, like I said, I will do much more in part four. But then 1 20th is a good starting point. For macro, shutter speed is not at all relevant, which means here you've got a whole range of shutter speed where you can basically triple the amount of light that's coming in just by using your shutter speed. There's one what I call intermediate speed that is between 1 th uh, 30th and 1 50th, so everything below 1 60th. If you put your camera into slow, uh, sh uh, into rear curtain uh, or second shutter, um, which I'll explain in section four, but essentially if you have your setting always in that, then you can get a mild motion blur, just a super slight blur, which I think is sometimes a very nice effect where even the back end of the animal you can see here is already slightly blurry. Yeah? Or here you can see it as well, the, how the reef is moving. If I'm panning with the camera, with the subject, I will get a slight motion blur uh, on, in this case, the reef. Um, and that makes a nice focus on the animal and it transports or conveys the the uh, message that this animal is in motion. And so it's a nice touch to work with 1 30th or 1 40th. You're going to have more lost photos, so more photos that are not ideal, but you might get some really nice ones. This was in Cocos Island last year. And I feel I really like this Stingray photo because it shows the motion um, going on. Now, uh, I'm surprised nobody asked me this question because this question usually comes up. What about shutter speed priority? Instead of manual mode, you can also use shutter speed priority. And shutter speed priority means you can freeze your shutter speed. So you tell your camera, I am going to 
um, put a certain shutter speed. For example, I want to shoot with 1 to 50th, and the camera will open the aperture in correspondence. So if the whole situation gets too dark, the camera will make a wider aperture, and if it gets too bright, it will make a smaller aperture. Now, that is sometimes good uh, for a starting point, particularly in wide angle. So because in wide angle, we always want to keep our stuff uh, sharp, you want to generally always freeze your shutter speed. And if it's easier for you to remember, then why not use shutter speed priority? It's the only semi-automatic program that I'm going to recommend for you. Um, there is a slight caveat um, that um, I have to explain to you, but essentially the camera will use all the aperture available. And there are certain parts of the aperture that we don't want to have. Uh, I thought I had a slide on that. All right, I think that slide's coming somewhere else. I'll show you that a little bit later, right? But essentially, the reason you don't, or the one thing that you don't want it to happen is that the aperture goes maximum. So if you have a fish eye or a wide angle camera, you might be able to go all the way to 4.0 or even lower with your widest uh, aperture. And the problem with that is that you then might get uh, chromatic aberrations on the side of your picture. I'm going to show you this in the aperture section. That's where the slide is. So that was uh, shutter speed. Is shutter speed clear or are there any questions specific to shutter speed? Manjula is asking if light control is not possible with shutter speed. Just think about it. Why would it not be possible? You're using your strobe light and the strobe light hits the subject and reflects into your camera. So how long you open it still influences how much light comes in. You can try it with your, um, with your camera. Take a picture of your hand um, with the strobe, so something that's within a meter of your, uh, of your camera, preferably closer, and just take photos with different shutter speeds. Start at 1 60th all the way to 1 2 50th. And when you start at 1 60th, make sure that your hand is nicely lit up. And then just keep taking the same photo and see if your hand gets darker because essentially the light is still coming through the same means. Even though the sync speed of the strobe is set to match your camera, doesn't mean that your camera, when it opens a certain amount of time, will let in more or less light. So the longer you open it, the more light will come in, including the strobe light. Yes. You're right, Manjula, that is correct. That is one problem of shooting in shutter speed priority or any priority for that matter, because essentially the camera doesn't know what you're doing underwater. Okay. Um, Daryl is asking if this is for compacts. No, the shutter speeds are the same for compacts. Hang on, let me go back here. Uh, where did I have it? Here. So on your camera, you also can shoot as a maximum of one two hundredths, I think, or maybe one two fiftieth, I'm not quite sure. But um, you also have the same problem if you shoot at one thirtieth or less, you will see that it will get blurry. So it is the same logic. The one thing that is different is motion blur is much easier with an SLR than on a mirrorless. That is, I actually can't explain why that is. But Aside from the motion blur, the rest is the same. In aperture, it's different, but shutter speeds is very similar. Okay, uh, Dot is asking if it's a good idea to use auto ISO, so that was to the earlier one. Um, in general, you already notice I'm not a fan of anything auto. I think you should do everything yourself, but you can do auto ISO. It will limit your, uh, if you can limit it to 400, but you cannot create any effects because the camera is taking the decisions for you. And essentially, if you want to create a range of photos from a trip that have different styles, you will need to make that decision because the camera is going to try to even out your lighting at all time. So therefore, I'm not a fan, but yes, you're right, you can. Um, and then at least you will not get in a too high area. Eduardo, yes, they will. Just try it, you will see. Um, above water, it's a bit harder to see, but below water, it's very easy to see. So if you take uh, something and you light it up with 1 60th with one strobe setting, 
and then you start tuning down your sh shutter speed all the way down to 1 250th, you will see how it gets darker. And that affects the strobe light as well. Uh, Vito, uh, in night dives, there's no difference. Generally, if the things are moving uh, at normal speed, uh, that shutter speed logic is the same. The one thing that you will have at night is that generally, because you don't have ambient light interfering, all your light's quite clean coming all from the strobe. There's no light coming from anywhere else. And so it's easier to get crisp details within your two meter range. But uh, it doesn't actually change anything about the shutter speed. With your compact camera, you can use your shutter speed to fine tune your lighting um, uh, even on a night dive. Okay, I'm just gonna go back here. All right, so I'm gonna go to the, yeah, Gernot, if your camera only does 1 60th, that is essentially what your camera can do. And you will find that when it's really, really fast moving action, you're gonna to have to have the strobe light as strong as possible. So the maximum amount of light uh, reflects from the subject, but 1 60th is a problem when you've got an older mirrorless or compact camera. Um, I don't know what camera you have, but maybe like an Olympus, EM1 Mark I or something, there you have a limit of 1 60th. Okay, aperture or f-stop, A6500. Oh, really? The 6500 only goes to 1 60th. Uh, that's, uh, I, I'll have a look. There might be a trick um, that you can apply. Okay, let's go to aperture. So aperture um, or f-stop comes from focal ratio of a lens, actually changes uh, in the lens camera combination. Generally, the confusing thing is the higher the number, the less light you get. Um, it's uh, traditionally, or it comes mathematically from a square root of two, um, but I find that it depends very much on your lens and on your camera combination, the stops are different. Also, it doesn't really matter. What you really need to think about is what is my widest aperture and what is my smallest aperture, and this is your range. So if uh, you have a compact camera, then it is usually like two to 10 or two to 11 or maybe two to 12. Whereas if you've got a SLR, you've got a much wider range. Um, but in relation, it still is kind of similar, the first quarter versus the first quarter. So depending on the size of your range. Um, if you notice this, if you have an uh, exchangeable lens system, then you will see here the maximum aperture that you can achieve. So for example, on this 7 to 200 millimeter, it's a very good lens. It has a permanent 2.8 um, uh, F factor. Um, so that means the 2.8 is possible on every step of the zoom. So even if you zoom all the way to 200, you can still widen the aperture to 2.8. Whereas on the right side, you have a picture of a cheaper lens, which is an 18 to 55. And this will say that if you're zooming to 18 millimeter, you get 3.5. But if you're zooming to 55 millimeter, you only get 5.6 maximum aperture. So widest aperture. So it's limiting your range um, for um, that. Uh, Virginia, I'm going to come back to your question in a moment. So here's an example, yeah, we've got the compact camera, which generally ranges from two to 11 in most cases, yeah, um, and the SLR, which ranges from 1.4 to 40. Now, the compact has, of course, less options in terms of uh, fine tuning and in terms of aperture effects, but with these better ones, like the Sony RX100 or the LX100 from uh, Panasonic or the G7X, you can get an aperture effect that is noticeable. You can get that effect, particularly if you use macro mode, you can definitely get an effect that is noticeable. Um, in an SLR, you can get much more extremer effects. In both cases, and this is the question that uh, Virginia was asking, is in both cases, particularly for underwater, you wanna stay away from the maximum for different reasons, but you don't wanna to go to the maximum aperture or the minimum aperture. In compact, you can, but in an SLR, you can't. Well, you can, but you will get a lot of aberrations, so problems in your picture. Here's an example. So these are all shot with my old SLR, 7100, so mid-range camera. 
um, a high f-stop, you can see there's much more detail. The eye and the, and the eggs are all sharp. Um, and only on the back of the uh, mantis shrimp, it starts getting unsharp. On the right side, you see one which is with a lower f-stop, which is uh, one tenth, uh, sorry, f10. And that is essentially, uh, you can see that only the eyes are sharp. And already the, the beginning of the, the arms is already not sharp and the eggs are really fuzzy. So with different f-stops, you can achieve different effects. Here's a drawing that I found uh, online that makes it very nice. Um, with a wide aperture or a small number, you have a shallow depth of field, which means you can only see a certain distance crisp and the rest less crisp. Right? So you get what we call bokeh, which I'll come to in a moment. If you use your maximum aperture, you actually get everything uh, sharp, the front and the back. Here is how it works, and I'm not a uh, very good person to explain you the physics uh, of this, but essentially, if your aperture is wide, then you get a less focus, focused area. So the area that you can focus, you can see here, starts between the, um, the, the dog and the girl. But if you shoot at f16, so you have a small opening, then the uh, range that you can keep sharp ranges from the dog all the way to the tree. And that is how you can use the aperture on system cameras, but also a little bit on the compact cameras in order to create a blurry or a sharp background. So for example, in section four, we're also gonna talk about split photography. And in split photography, we generally wanna use a high aperture because we wanna get something in the water sharp and also something that is in the sky sharp so therefore we want to get a uh, uh, uh we want to have a sharp aperture or a small aperture to create a sharp effect so this is another answer for uh virginia's question is depending on what you're trying to do your aperture is important to create how much bokeh you get so here are some uh, uh just the graphic uh, explanation of how this all relates so in the left you've got your maximum aperture that means the opening is the widest so again if you take a photo it would be like this it's closed it opens and it closes but you're telling it how wide it opens the smaller it is the more direct sunlight comes in and therefore you get a sharper uh background and a and, and more depth of field, right? So here you can see in the bottom, uh, the wider the aperture, the less depth of field you get. Depth of field means how much of the picture is sharp, and the smaller it is, the better uh, you see the background and the more depth of field you have. Now, this is the very confusing thing in the beginning. A wide aperture has a small number, and a small aperture has a big number. So that is something that you just have to remember. I personally, because all of this has to do about light, I personally like to think of it as, think about the amount of light that you're getting um, and the bigger number, it's like, if, it's, if you see it like a divided by, it's like F divided by 16, the same like shutter speed, so a higher number would be less light. But that's not true, it's just a way how you can remember it in the beginning. Um, what we use it underwater for is deciding on the background sharpness. So here you can take, uh, you can see this picture was taken with an SLR, but to answer earlier um, a question by uh, Daryl, you can see that with a compact, in order to get a picture like this where the background is sharp, you can see the fish swimming here in the back, right? That would be a very high aperture. And if you want to get a really nice creamy bokeh, then you want to work with the widest possible aperture. Again, we have to think of the secondary effect, which is the effect it has on the lighting. So the bigger the opening, the more light you have coming in. So that means if you are going for a wide aperture effect, you're also getting a lot of extra light that you have to deal with. Or if you're gonna to try to make the background sharp with your small opening, then you have to deal with having a lot less light and you might have to use the other tools to uh, compensate for that. 
So here's some examples of very wide uh, apertures. We call this bokeh, or people call this bokeh. So all that stuff that is blurry is bokeh, and that is actually from Japanese, I looked up. So bokeh is Japanese, apparently, um, and stands for blur or haze. Um, so um, bokashi, apparently, is what we're doing, is where we're intentionally blurring or degrading the picture. Um, and yeah, if you're a bokeh, as a dude, then you actually have a mental haze or you're a bit of an idiot. And that means bokeh in Japanese. Are there any Japanese here to tell me if that's true? That's anyway what Dr. Wikipedia told me. So here we got a nice photo making use of the aperture. So you got, you know, the crinoid shrimp here on the feather star. Um, and you can see the background nicely disappearing into the back. This is shot with F10 and a diopter. Because if you use a diopter, the effect of bokeh is stronger. And here again is where the uh, compact cameras come into play. So if you use a diopter on your compact camera, you will see that you can create this bokeh. So with a wider aperture, you get uh, more bokeh and with a small aperture, you get less. It's without the, um, um, without the, the um, uh, diopter is where you have less of this effect. Here we have a picture with a little bit uh, uh, more depth of field. So here you can see both of the subjects are sharp, or almost sharp anyway, um, which is important because there's two of them. But also we get the whole background of the cleaner shrimp, and we get them to a detail that we can recognize them. And this was intended here. So here you're playing with how much picture information you want in, and for this picture I wanted to have more visible than in the previous picture, oops, in the previous picture where I wanted this creamy effect where you just have the focus on the eyes. There is a big difference if you're using a macro lens or a wide angle lens. So here are two pictures that are both taken at 7.1. Again, not a compact, this is a system camera, but the same picture taken with a 60 millimeter macro you can see that this frogfish that is maybe about this size is only sharp on the outside of the lips and already the eye that is literally a finger width behind it is already unsharp. Whereas here, these baby sharks, oops, these baby sharks shot in Maldives, you can see the detail on the third shark is still quite rich. So you can see quite a lot of things, although I am shooting with 7.1. That is because when we are shooting with a fisheye or a wide angle, this is actually, oh, I didn't do a very good job here. The pictures of a fisheye and the picture was taken with a wide angle, so my apologies. But um, essentially the effect is the same. The wider your lens, the less depth of field you get. So you can only create depth of field if you get really, really close. So here, this is actually also in the Maldives, in Mofushi, you can see I'm really, really close you know, the blue line uh, snappers are maybe, you know, maybe this big, and I'm super, super close. They're literally swimming right in front of my lens. And there you can see with F9, the manta rays are slightly fuzzy, but nothing compared to shooting F9 with macro, where you essentially get, you know, creamy bokeh at, set, at even F10, F13, you still get bokeh right behind the subject. So the wider the lens, the less bokeh you get, in fish you have almost no bokeh, which means we can use the aperture for ambient light control. That means we can use not the shutter speed, but we use the aperture because it makes no difference. If I'm shooting at 7.1 or 10 or 13 on a fisheye, it makes practically no difference. So I can use this rather than the shutter speed to correct my picture brightness. So here you uh, see the two pictures that I showed earlier. So one was actually taken with 7.1 and the other one was taken with F20, right? So the shutter speed was probably the same because the shark is the same speed. I wouldn't change the shutter speed, but the aperture is totally different. And the aperture difference is what makes the picture dark because less uh, aperture or smaller aperture, you get less light coming in. And that is essentially how you can make the effect. 
Uh, Manjula, wet lenses do not apply in that regard that they're not connected to the camera, but the compact camera with the fisheye, you will notice that it will be very hard for you to get any depth of field uh, with a fisheye diopter. So this is how you would approach it. So you have here your Murray eel, sorry, not a very nice subject uh, in that picture, but I just want to show how you can make a different picture of the same thing. So obviously the top one, we've got more background brightness than the bottom. So the top one probably has a faster shutter speed and a smaller aperture and the bottom one is opposite. And that is essentially how you can change the style of a picture very easily. Uh, Alex is asking about the two uh, tiger shark pictures. Uh, these were shot with, this is a few years ago. This is CNC D1, I think. So, you know, mid-range strobes. I'll show you later which way they are positioned. So this is what I mentioned earlier. You cannot use all of your aperture range. So while you can use different apertures in wide angle and fisheye photography to get different picture information in, what you can't do is go too wide. So if you look at here, the corner, you can see that quite a serious part of the picture on each side has these blurry areas. And this is not bokeh, this is actually curvature problems that we get with our lens when we shoot with a too wide aperture. And therefore, the limit for your uh, system camera fish eye shots and wide angle shot should be 7.1. If you go wider than that, you get more and more curvature. And the smaller your dome is, the more of these curvature effects you get. So if you have a mirrorless camera in a, you know, like one of these 4.5 inch uh, domes, you want to limit yourself to 7.1 widest aperture because otherwise you're going to get these fuzzy corners, which is quite ugly when it is touching a subject. I will uh, talk about strobes in a moment, Martin. So now we are uh, with aperture, we could also use aperture priority, right? So we could use the A mode or in Canon, this is called uh, the AV mode. Um, and this would essentially mean you fix an aperture and the camera decides the shutter speed. Now underwater, I can really not recommend that because the camera will just use all of the shutter speed available. And as soon as it gets a bit dark, which happens a lot underwater, then the shutter speed will drop and it will go to 1 30th or 1 20th when you're not ready for it. And it just a much higher risk of taking poor photos. So while shutter speed priority is okay uh, in, in some regards, um, the aperture priority I generally don't recommend. Sorry, I'm just gonna go back here because Martin is saying that the two strobe pictures, the effect would not be possible. So if we look at these two pictures, what would these pictures look like if I wouldn't have the strobe on? The left picture, I would have still the same blue background, but I would have a dark shark in front of me, a dark shark head silhouette. The right picture would be completely black, right? What I still have done is I've applied a difference to the ambient light with using my aperture. You can also see that the strobe light is much better, so the animal is much better lit in the first picture than in the second picture, because the smaller you make the aperture, the less strobe light comes in. This was an earlier question, if it actually, if that strobe light is affected, it is affected by aperture and shutter speed. It's the same thing. The strobe light goes in to the picture, it touches onto a subject, reflects, comes back in. If I open it longer, more of that strobe light's gonna come in. If I open it less long, then you will have less. Aperture size, if I open it wide, or if I open it small, more or less light come in. It's essentially like one of these, uh, one of these uh, hourglasses. I wasn't meant to use this earlier. I don't know if I can get this sharp. No. But anyway, you know what these things are, yeah? If you turn these around and let the sand run through, essentially, when you widen the 
the, the, the inside, you would get the sand going through faster. And if you close it and open it for a certain amount of time, there's a certain amount of sand coming in. And your strobe light is a certain amount of light going into the uh, picture. And the longer you open it, the wider you open it, the more light you will get in. Okay. I have to apologize once again. Um, <laughs> I've been uh, I've been overshooting, so my apologies. We're going to be taking uh, at least twenty more minutes. I apologize for that. Um, I really seem to try to pack too much always into these talks. Um, so, um, yep. Let me just go to. This was the one that I wanted to show. So in wide angle aperture, think in terms of your minimum and your maximum. And for system cameras, so mirror, mirrorless or SLR, do not go lower than 7.2 if you can avoid it. Um, for the compacts, you can go to the maximum of 2.0. You shouldn't get the fuzzy corners. When you use a fish eye diopter, you will always have a little bit fuzzy corners just because the way the physics work there, right? So if you use a, uh, a wide angle wet lens, you uh, are probably safer if you stay away from these lower apertures as well. So same there. Um, if you're taking pictures of macro, again, think in terms of your minimum and your maximum. So if you're using uh, a system camera, you probably don't want to have a much wider aperture than 13 or maybe 10. Whereas with a compact, you can go all the way to two, no problem. For um, the maximum, in terms of background, you can go all the way to the end. Sometimes I shoot a picture with, um, with uh, F30, and that's no problem. And the compact, you can also max it out, no problem. So you can use this effect as much as you want. If you're going to use a diopter, so a wet macro lens for a system camera, you want to try to get the aperture smaller, so a higher number, because you're going to get extreme bokeh. unless you're going for uh, extreme bokeh. So if you take a picture like this, what I like to call super bokeh, so this is shot with a diopter and uh, a 60 millimeter at 6.3, you can see that only the tip of the rhinophore is not even really sharp. It's literally just a tiny bit of sharpness, but because it's one of these purple violet uh, nudibranchs, it swims in a sea of uh, purple violet, and therefore it's a nice effect. But it is, if it were an above water photo, it would not be considered a, a good photograph, uh, or if anything, a artistic photograph, but not a sharp photograph in any means. So if you want to play with that, of course, you can go over the extremes. But if you don't want to get pictures that are that blurry, then you want to be two, two well, have at least two digits in your number in the aperture. So now we've explained the three. So here, let's look at two pictures. Again, I'm using a lot of examples uh, from, um, uh, from uh, Benga Lagoon. You see here the bull sharks. Again, I didn't move on the entire dive. Um, and you can see on the left, we've got a lot more uh, picture information in the back. Yeah, so that means we've got a wider aperture. The shutter speed is probably the same or worst case, maybe 1 60th and the strobe is low because there's more light coming in. Now, if you reduce everything, so if you make the aperture small and the shutter speed fast, I know some of you think that there's no influence by the, uh, for the strobe light, but the strobe light is affected. You can see that you need much more strobe light to achieve the same thing because the camera will not let as much light in. So when you are reducing the aperture and the shutter speed to make less ambient light and you want to keep the same amount of artificial light, you're going to have to increase it accordingly. And now comes my tip in terms of making your life easier. Rather than using aperture or shutter speed priority, just think about what you can use to fine tune when you're in wide angle and when you're in macro. In wide angle, we're speed priority. We want to freeze motion. Whereas in macro, we want to focus on how much background we want to have and how much bokeh we want to have. So my suggestion is when you're shooting in wide angle, you fix the shutter and you use the aperture to fine tune how much light's coming in. And in macro, you do the other way around. So you fix your aperture 
and you use your shutter speed to fine tune the amount of light. Of course, you've set your ISO as a general direction, but now the advantage is, so I'm just gonna skip over that. But now the advantage is that you only need to work with two things rather than with all three. So the advantage is in wide angle, you can pretty much leave your shutter speed untouched and just use your aperture, which is very helpful is when you're working with a subject and you just wanna quickly brighten something, I try to remember how much of my aperture dial do I have to change. So if I have a shark swimming around me and maybe there's a situation where it could be above me, I'll make a test shot into the sunlight and see how far do I have to change my aperture dial to adjust against the sunlight. And then I'll go back to my normal shot. But if the shark now swims above me, I know I have to do a certain amount of turn on the dial and then I can shoot up. Rather than focusing on all three, I can now focus on one only, only the shutter speed. And in macro, it's the other way around. If you want to fine tune, you can use the shutter speed to fine tune your, uh, your brightness. Now, the exception would be that if in macro you wanted to do a slow shutter, I can tell you uh, this picture that you see, you probably took 600 photos to make um, and it's still not good. Um, so um, if you wanted to go for a slow shutter speed, then you could use the aperture for your lighting effect. So to create the back background, you could use the aperture. But in most cases, you would go for the aperture effect, which means there's certain amount of this, um, of this pygmy seahorse that I want to see sharp. In this case, I was going for trying to get both eyes sharp. And so I use the speed for fine tuning my lighting. So one more time, these are the three steps. ISO is for your overall lighting then you fix your primary effect either with your aperture or your shutter speed and then you fine tune with your secondary so that is how i uh, try to make things easier in shooting in full manual mode obviously as you remember i always think you should do test shots as much as possible because here you can already decide how the background of the lighting is i remember where i took this photo but i was trying to get ready for something and you can see in the bottom right hand corner both the background lighting and the uh, strobe lighting is now correct, whereas in the, all the other pictures, it is not. So if now the shark swims by, I have the per perfect exposure. One more time, the limits. Shutter speed maximums are 320 up top, if your camera can do it. And I would generally not go below 1 60th unless you're shooting with strong strobe light and you've got yourself set to second curtain, which as I said, I'll explain in the next, in the second next session, in the wide angle one. Um, the depth of field is the thing that in aperture you wanna be careful with. Um, chromatic aberration starts at 7.1, oops, spelling mistake. Um, so below 7.1 for system cameras, you wanna avoid if you're shooting fish or wide angle. And ISO, your grains will start at 500 to 800. Okay, uh, Ro, um, that is a question I spoke about already uh, last time. So if you're shooting in RAW, you don't actually have to change your white balance. So all the old school uh, photo teaching also had the white balance as a very important thing to do, but the RAWs today are so good. So the RAW files that your camera do uh, are so good that you can choose the white balance in the photo uh, editing, so in post-processing. So that means, yes, I do change my uh, white balance every now and then, but mm, you know, a 10 day trip to Raja Ampat, I changed my white balance once or twice. Uh, like when we went to the jellyfish lake and everything was green, okay, then I changed a little bit. Um, but normally I don't change my white balance. I do that all in uh, Lightroom. And if you don't know how to use Lightroom, please check out, I've got a four piece series that a lot of the people who are here have already uh, seen. Um, and um, there I explain how you can change your white balance. So no, you don't have to uh, fuzzy with the white balance because that's just a waste of your time. Definitely, Teresa, don't use auto, okay? Don't use white balance auto. By no means use auto because the camera does not know that you're underwater. So it will change the thing around every way uh, the light comes in and your pictures will not look good. What you want to do is you want to generally set your uh, white balance to something like, uh, you know, a warm yellow light, like 5,000 
200 or 5,400 is what I use most of the time. And you take a picture and if it roughly looks blue, then don't worry about the rest because the camera, sorry, Lightroom will adjust that actually automatically. And then with a couple of tricks that, you know, we, we discussed in Lightroom, you can just uh, fine tune that very easily. As a matter of fact, I'm going to release a video this week, which talks about white balance. So uh, Teresa and Ro, just, uh, I hope you're subscribed to my uh, YouTube channel because I'm going to release a four uh, minute uh, piece about how to white balance your pictures underwater. So uh, just wait, wait for that. Okay, that was manual mode. Questions on manual mode. We still got strobe lighting to do and I'm already over an hour. My apologies, my time management is so un-German that is really, uh, really quite uh, drastic how much I'm overdoing. But the second part is not as long, so I'm just gonna dive right in. Artificial light, so strobe lighting, this is where we add the beauty into the picture. You can see this picture would be quite boring unless we had a strobe or this here in uh, Southwest Rocks uh, in Australia would not be the same if I wouldn't have strobe light. So for me, artificial light is like painting color and detail into your picture. You're taking a picture with ambient light with your camera and with your strobe light, you brush detail into the picture. Like I mentioned earlier, only do this for subjects closer than two meters and you actually can create this effect. Very often people show me photos and say, hey, the strobe light, I can't see anything lit up. That is because you're too far away from the thing to light it up. So here is a very good example of a picture that many of you might think was taken on a night dive. Well, this picture was taken at 12 o'clock on a like 10 to 12 meter reef in the Philippines, and it was taken at broad daylight. That is because I told my camera to be dark. So I took my first camera shots without any brightness. You tune your camera down by, now you know all the tools, aperture would be small, shutter speed would be fast, ISO would be low, and you create a picture that is fully black. And then you start adding your strobe light and you can actually decide how you want this thing to be lit up. And that is why I separate these two steps because essentially you decide what details are in with your flash. Also, you might have noticed when you take pictures of uh, animals, when you shoot them with strobe light, the details are much richer. That is because the light is not filtered through so much water as it is when there's no strobe light. So in the left, you've got a picture of a bull shark in Mexico with no strobe light on, and the only light that comes in is the sunlight that has to go all the way 25 meters down to the bottom of the seafloor, therefore already gets filtered out tremendously, and there reflects less detail. Whereas in the next picture, same situation, same, maybe not the same shark, but same day anyway, and the strobe light is on, now we can see a lot of beautiful detail. Same with the whale sharks. On the left, you see a whale shark with no strobe, and on the right, with strobe, and the detail is totally different. One has an eye, the other one doesn't have an eye. One has an ear, the other one doesn't, et cetera, et cetera. So the strobes are very, very important to add uh, uh, detail into your pictures. The other thing is that, as we already pointed out, white balance is, uh, is strongly affected by the light traveling through 30 meters of water, we're filtering out the reds and the yellows, and we are left with the greens and the blues. Whereas the strobe only travels one meter or maximum, as you know, two meters, and therefore it doesn't filter out the reds and the yellows, and we retain the whole color spectrum. So you just get much better uh, subject separated photos if you use strobe light. Like I said, only closer than two meters. As I already mentioned a couple of times, you use your ambient light uh, by the camera. So you set the brightness of the light that comes in with your camera and you subject light with your flash. So you use the pyramid below for your ambient part and the flash at the top with your subject lighting, which you should do last in the process. So here you can see how I'm approaching a, uh, a picture. I'm taking multiple photos in this case with a fixed aperture, and I'm just using the shutter speed to fine tune how much light is coming in. And once I've decided what the right one is, I let the model swim in and I take the picture. 
make sure you plan your angle as i mentioned earlier right with ambient light it's the same when you use your strobe light it is still different if the sun is in your back so here we're shooting with the sun in our back we only need a little bit of strobe light to uh you know get some detail on this oceanic white tip whereas if you're shooting against the sunlight you need a lot of light power because you need to close the aperture and the shutter speed so that the picture doesn't get a light bleed and then you need to have so strong power in order to still get any brightening on the subject um, so here you can see a picture taken with full power so let's talk a little bit about strobes because many people always ask this question um, first of all uh, video light is not the same as a strobe so if you only have a video light and you're surprised that a lot of these effects that i'm describing you cannot get that is not surprising because it's not a strobe you do not get the same effect from a constant light source that you can get from a strobe so while video lights are great uh, as focus lights and they're also great for video they're not good for strobe lighting there are some exceptions like if you're in a wreck or in a cave video light can work because it's pretty dark and you can high power them up and you can shoot with relatively high iso because you don't have much blues to work with so in a wreck you can use video lights but if you want to do only video light on a reef you're going to find that you're not going to get the detail that you get with strobes then we've got sort of what we call, what i would call entry level strobe lights like the uh, inon s2000 d200 or um, the ys 03s and these things um, these are sold as entry-level strobes, but I feel they're often sold in the wrong way because people are surprised then that they cannot take wide-angle pictures. Now, this uh, is because they are not actually capable of, of highlighting anything that is further away than 50 centimeters or maybe a meter. Maximum, maximum a meter is what you can light with these. After that, the light already thins out and you don't get a good effect anymore. So generally, I know that is hard, but generally I recommend you go immediately to a subtle, solid middle class, like your, your, your Volkswagen kind of car, right? Which is uh, right now the most reliable one is the Inon Z330, but you know, there's the uh, D, D2s and 3s. Um, there's a whole bunch in this area. There's the Retra. Uh, there's a whole bunch that are all in this area of guide number 30. Now, these ones are the right ones for most, and most professionals, including myself, use these strobes. They are the right balance between size and power, and they allow you to do all the effects I'm talking about easily and comfortably. Now, there's one size up. Those are the really strong ones like the uh, Seacam C Flash and the uh, Red 64s that you see here behind me. Um, now, those are... For starters very expensive so you really need to think about if you know you really want those but also they're quite clunky so they're twice the size in terms of you know outside weight although they're often neutral in the water they're quite heavy to carry but they are really really good if you want to use them for example for sunbursts so a photo that i just showed you with the shark against the sunlight i did do that with uh, actually the the old uh, CNC D ones at full power, but it is much easier to shoot them with a powerful strobe, particularly if you want to keep shooting fast. So the recycling speed on the Inon uh, Z330 when you're at full power is 1.6 seconds. So one, two. In that time, shark's already gone. Whereas in that time, with the Red 64 at the same power, I can shoot eight shots. So the shark swims by and I go bum, 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 bum. And it's all at the same power as the full power of the Inon Z330. Now, am I recommending that you buy such expensive uh, strobes? I don't think it's justified unless, you know, money is not an issue. Then if money is not an issue, it's absolutely fabulous to shoot with these strobes. But um, otherwise, the Inon 330 is currently my recommended model, even for beginners. How do you fire them? You can shoot them via optical cables. That is the easiest way to do it. It's also uh, no leakage risk. They're easily replaceable. You can switch them easily between models. That's very useful. But in most situations, you're using your internal flash to trigger the strobes. And the built-in strobes or the built-in flash in the camera is very slow to recycle. So that means your strobe 
your outside strobe is already ready to shoot again, but you're still waiting for your camera to recycle. So if you are using optical cables or if your housing only supports optical cables, see if your housing supports a uh, LED trigger. So this is the EM1, EM5 LED trigger from Nauticam. The Nauticam housings all have a spared part. Actually, you can use those in an Isotta housing as well. And instead of using your built-in flash, you're using this LED trigger and the LED trigger can fire as fast as you need. So if you're using opticals I, and you have this option of using an LED trigger, I would strongly recommend it. If you're having an SLR or a system camera, you can also choose to use a sync cords. That is where you have absolutely no weighting of recycling speed. The only limit of recycling speed is of your external strobe. They are a bit more expensive. So a twin cable like this will maybe be 150 US. So definitely more expensive, but um, it is more comfortable. It is more sturdy. Um, and if you really wanted to, you could use TTL in a proper way. Not that I do that, but you could use through the lens um, uh, imaging. Okay, so what do we use the strobe for? Only to light the subject, but not the background and not the backscatter. So let's look at how we do that. So here's a picture of an octopus in uh, Chuk. And you can see here on the left is the same octopus with the, uh, with the diver right behind. And you can see that there's a lot of backscatter, right? It's the same situation as the next photo that you see on the right. It's the same octopus a little bit later. And you can see there is no backscatter in this picture. That is because I have changed the setting of my strobes. And there's an, uh, this illumination from uh, this guy, uh, Hunsinger. And you can see that the more the strobe points into the space between you and the subject, the more you're lighting up floating particles between you and the subject. So what we try to do is we try to get only the amount of light that we need on the subject and as little as possible light on the area in between the camera and the subject. So that's why you will see that most people, when they're doing it right, keep their strobes behind their lens or their dome. And that is one way to reduce backscatter because you are therefore not lighting as much here on the inside as you would if you had the strobe further forward. Um, I don't know if this is a correct term, but I like to call this fringe light. So what we actually use from our strobes is not the uh, the center beam. You would think that with your strobe, you are um, let me just get with your strobe, you would think that you're shooting directly at a subject, which you would do if you are above the water. You would have a flash and you shoot direct. But actually, the center is really, really hot, and this will light up everything as well. So what we want to do is we want to turn it away and only shoot with this outside light. And so if you can um, see my pretty basic diagram here, but what I'm trying to show here is the space in between the dome and the beginning of the fish. There's no light here at all. So we're keeping the area between us and the subject free of light and therefore no backscatter can be lit up in between. That is why we use fringe light. Although we've got these super powerful strobes, most of the time we're pointing them slightly away from the subject so we avoid lighting up the inside of the area between us and the subject. Uh, Teresa is asking manual over TTL. I think you already know how I operate. I am basically always thinking that you should make the decisions. If you're using TTL in uh, most cameras, I think you have a compact camera, the TTL is not a reel through the lens. It's not actually doing a metering through the camera because you're only using an optical cable. So there's no way that you actually communicate something to the inside of the camera. So therefore it's a STTL, a smart TTL, which means the strobe is now deciding on uh, the strobe is now deciding on what lighting would be appropriate and the strobe doesn't know what effect you're trying to achieve. So therefore, I don't think it is advisable to use TTL. In macro, it can work, but in wide angle, I definitely wouldn't use it. Yeah. So Teresa, in this setup, the OMD 10 and the D1s definitely use manual 
decide how much light you want to do. I'll give you now a couple more pointers that are going to help you fine tune that. Definitely don't use it in TTL because you don't have a real TTL. I'm coming to that, Manjula. Just uh, give me a moment. So here you see the two uh, uh, strobes pointing out, and you will see that they're not pointing at the subject and therefore not lighting the area between us and the subject. So we come to the two basic setups for twins. Um, basically, in wide angle, we want to have them wider out, pointing out. And in macro, we want the beams to cross behind the subject so that we're still using the fringe light to cover the inside. So here is an example with my camera setup on how you would have a a wide, wide angle setup and a narrow macro setup. If you've got a super wide area, so for example, a lot of fish, like this is the, uh, um, this is the sea bream spawn in Palau. There's so many fish and if you wanna get a wall of yellow here, you really need to set yourself up wide so that you get even lighting across all the fish. And you can see I only so-and-so managed to do that. It's not, not even that good. Here you see a typical situation that you, if you have two strobes, would have encountered a couple times. Um, and um, that is what we call a center shadow. So can you imagine what's happening here? The strobes are wide and I'm shooting with fringe light forward but the area in between, the subject's actually now closer, and so I'm shooting past the subjects. You can see the outside of the fish is bright, and the inside of the fish is dark. That is an adjustment that many people forget to take. So this is what we call close focus wide angle. So the closer the subject comes to your camera, the closer you need to bring in the strobes. Um, so here's a good example of what happens, yeah? The strobes are set to wide, and the zebra batfish is swimming closer to the uh, lens, and therefore I'm lighting all the sand behind it, but I'm not actually lighting the actual zebra crab, uh, zebra uh, batfish. So this shows you that the wide setup doesn't work, even though this is a wide angle setup, it is a close focus wide angle. The subject is actually really, really close, so we need to change our strobe positioning. So here we've got a giant frogfish really close, maybe, uh, what is this, 10 centimeters away from the dome. And the strobes need to therefore be a lot closer that you actually get light on the middle of the subject. I like to call this the triangle rule. And that generally means the closer your subject is to your lens, the closer should be your strobes. This is not a scientific measure, but it helps you estimate roughly where your strobes should be. So if I've got a shark and it looks like it's gonna come in close to me, I often just push my strobes in from the side real quickly and I'm ready for a close focus wide angle shot. So if you keep this in mind, you will avoid getting very bright centers when you're keeping the strobes closed when the subject is far away or opposite, you're, getting, you're avoiding the center shadow when you are taking a photo like this. So here you can see this crocodile in Mexico and this crocodile is literally, I'm not kidding you, is three centimeters from my dome, okay? Like this wide away from my dome. This is just a super cooperative animal. This is the handler obviously, so he knew, he knew what he was doing, but he was so cooperative that I just put my camera right there, right in front, and then I put my strobes just next to the camera and that is how I get this light really, really nicely on the nose detail of the crocodile. If uh, you have this problem very often, despite what you're doing, then you might wanna get a dome. Um, as you guys know, the Inons now come with these dome diffusers, so they already help with this, but you can also buy dome diffusers for your strobes. Right? So if you've got a weak strobe, don't do it because it, it actually takes one, one to two stops away from your power, but generally, the, uh, the dome diffusers help you avoid these darkened areas because what they do is they spread the light more. So here we've got a simple diffuser which comes out of the box, right? And this already creates a diffused light, but you can buy a diffuser dome that you put on the top and you get a much more wider spread of light and you therefore can light up the center of your picture easier, particularly when you're doing close focus wide angle. 
The triangle also triangle rule also applies when you're doing a macro photo. So here you can see a macro photo taken without the diopter. So the nudibranch is maybe what, like 20, 30 centimeters away. Then your strobes should also move out. Whereas if it's like five centimeters away from your, uh, you know, uh, diopter, then you can bring in the strobes close and you can see if you imagine the beam of the lights, it would actually meet behind the subject. Yeah, and there you can avoid therefore that the backscatter in between would light up. A couple of words about strobe power. So one thing that people often forget is as soon as you get a further distance, the need for your lighting increases. So if you've got a subject 50 centimeters away and then it's a meter away, you in fact have to increase the power quite dramatically to make up for that difference. So one important thing that you want to keep in mind is that if you're taking a picture of your hand, that is obviously maximum meter away, but the subject is going to be two meters away. When you take your test photo, the light on your hand should be stronger than what is needed to light up your hand because the subject is going to be further away than your hand, if that makes any sense. So the strobe power is preferably adjusted from the bottom up. So if you're trying to make a good photo, you just want to add the, the strobe with every photo a little bit more, and then also adjust the strobe slightly where you need them so that you can light up the fan entirely. You can see if you compare it with the beginning picture, the blue is exactly the same. See, the diver has barely moved, but I have changed the power of my strobes dramatically. The other thing that you need to think about is how close the subject is and how each part of the body gets lit up differently by your strobes. So here you can see the left eye and the right eye is almost identically lit. But if you look really in detail, you can see the left side is a bit stronger lit than the right side. So I could have done an even better job in lighting up this turtle because the right side is slightly darker than the left side. But that is a thing that I would like to give you as an advice is your strobe settings should be constantly in adjustment because this distance problem, if you've got something that is further away of the animal than another part of the animal, you actually need to light it in a different way. The thing that you need to consider is what is the surface that you're primarily lighting up. In this picture, it is the face, both sides of the face and the body. But in other pictures, if the fish is swimming that way, then it's only one surface of the animal that you want to light up. And that is where you want to put more power. And to answer Manjula's questions, if you have a, um, a single strobe, you need to think about the surface that you want to light up. So here, okay, this is a surface lighting from the top, right? Because we've got flat uh, table coral. So that means the light needs to come from the top. But I'm going to show you the next two pictures, which are both taken with a compact camera. And here, the surface is flat. So the strobe light needs to come from the above, because that is the surface that we're trying to light. Equally here, we've got a blue spotted stingray, and we want a light from the top. Actually, a bit too far from the left here for my taste. But essentially, it is a single strobe where you decide what surface you're actually lighting up. Um, Ro is asking about the uh, color temperature. Uh, many people will tell you that the color temperature matters, but I think it's a very old school way of looking. The Inon guys actually sell you different color temperature uh, diffusers. So the diffuser cap from Inon, you can buy them in different temperatures, but I don't find that it makes such a big difference because in the end you can change it all in Lightroom. So I don't think that that makes such a big difference. So here is a good example of the tail of the frogfish being closer or being closer to the strobe than the face. Because I'm uh, lighting up the frogfish, this is actually Pauline, if you guys know Pauline, the very early days when uh, we started diving together. And uh, you can see that because I put the frogfish on the right and the diver on the left, from the first starting setting, the right side is closer to the fish and therefore you've got too much light on the tail. 
So what you see first here is the tail of the giant frogfish, but that is not what we want. We want the lighting to be on the face of the frogfish. So here I had to power up the left and reduce the power on the right to create a more even lighting on the frogfish. But you can see I'm paying with backscatter, right? Because I'm doing that, I've also created more backscatter on the right, and that is essentially, um, you know, I'm paying for trying to light up the uh, front of the fish. So if you use a second strobe, you can still do surface lighting, but you want to power down the less important strobe. So you want to really play with both strobes so that you can create the effect that you're going for. Another huge advantage of using single strobe modular is that you can create shadows much easier than with two strobes. So depending on how you set your strobes, you can create shadows. And with two strobes, you get no shadows. So if you're going to do a one dominant strobe and one that is weaker, you can still create shadows. Like on this picture here, we get shadows on the eye. But there's still a second strobe intact lighting up the rest of the picture, but it is much weaker than the dominant strobe. Here we've got, again, a single strobe setup with top lighting, and you create this sort of shadowy effect on the moray eel. That is because we don't have a second strobe, and we're shooting it in a way that creates shadows. So it's a thing to keep in mind that you can create a very nice shadow effect. If you're shooting with two strobes, as I mentioned earlier, you need to really think about your angle and how much power you need. So in the left one, you need a lot of power. On the right one, you need little power. Another thing that's very important is if you are, um, if you are having to choose between overexposure and underexposure, you always want to overexpose. Not against the sunlight, but otherwise you want to overexpose. So here you've got a picture where I totally underexposed, and this is the maximum I could get out of it. Very grainy picture, not nice detail. You can see the IT detail is very bad. Equally, this photo was taken on the same dive, different shark, but same dive. And you can see the original photo was totally overdone. But you can bring it down, whoops, sorry. You can bring it down and the detail is still there and we get nice detail on the eyes, on the nose, on the teeth. So generally, you want to overexpose because that's how you retain detail. How can you overexpose? You can just do it or you can use um, exposure compensation. This is this plus the... Uh, three plus zero seven or plus one that you can add. The camera will always add basically uh, an additional um, uh, third of a stop or more. You could use bracketing, although that only works without strobes. And what I use generally is using the screen brightness. So by reducing the brightness of your screen, what you see on the camera is darker and therefore you're gonna take brighter pictures. So for everybody who can, you know, like on everybody who's got like a system camera, you can easily reduce the LCD brightness. And every time you review your photos, if it's darker, you're going to have a tendency to make it a little bit brighter. And that is how I keep my photos a little bit brighter than, uh, than I should and therefore retain more details. The last thing I wanted to mention is the sunbursts, um, but I'm going to cover this in section four in much more detail. Um, how do you uh, capture sunbursts? Well, the most important thing is you play with your ambient light and your strobe light until you've got the right uh, setting. Um, fast shutter speed creates better um, sun rays, as you can see in this picture. So once you've got a high shutter speed and a small aperture set, then you can go in, like I did here for a close focus wide angle picture of a scorpion fish, maybe this size, shot with a fish eye and a slight sunburst in the back or evening sunburst, and there, you are putting all the techniques we learned to, uh, today together. We've got a little bit of surface lighting here, and we've got a sunburst in the back, and that is a nice uh, final picture for what we talked about today. So we talked about ambient light. You know, I talk about this a lot because I find it very important. Manual mode, I hope it was not too much detail. Uh, artificial light in both sections, macro and uh, wide angle, I'm going to talk a lot more about official, artificial light. So we're in macro, we're going to talk about snoot lighting, we're going to talk about backlighting, we're going to talk about x-ray lighting, we're going to talk about front side, all the different kinds of lighting techniques. 
also in wide angle. I'll be talking a lot more about that. Um, also, we're going to be doing split shots. Uh, we're going to be doing shut slow shutter. We're going to be doing all kinds of creative techniques. So I'm going to uh, make a very rich macro and a very rich wide angle uh, talk. So I hope you guys are going to join that as well. Uh, Teresa is asking why small aperture means it's small number or small hole. I what? That's a good question. When I say small aperture, I mean physically a small aperture, but it's a large number. Yeah, so that's what I say. I think that is the correct way of saying it, but it's a good question. Not quite sure. It could be that it's not 100% correct. Any other questions, guys? Whoops. Any other questions? Teresa, no, the other way around. A small aperture would be f8 uh, on your camera. Sorry, on your camera, f20. All right, so the aperture is small, but the number is large. That's unfortunately you have to try and find a way to to remember that. That's just how it is. Okay, um, Alex is asking, what's a good strobe setup for snorkeling after bigger and faster animals? Um, let me just get my camera. So this here obviously is not a great setup to be snorkeling, right? Well, this is bright enough. This is too much for snorkeling. So what I uh, tend to do sometimes is I might put one of these strobes on one single arm and fold it on top of the camera. So you would have in your snorkeling setup, the strobe would be just here and only in the moment where you actually can, you know, use a strobe, you could flip it up to get lighting from the top. But it's not going to be in your way when you swim. Because the big problem with snorkeling with a strobe is that you get much more resistance. So what I usually would use is a float arm like this, but just one and one strobe attached to that. But it's on the left side where it doesn't interfere with my controls on the camera, right? And only if I need it, I will flip it out and use it. But most times you actually are not allowed to use strobes. And if you got sunlight, it's actually a better way to light up um, uh, something like a whale shark. More questions. Anybody else? Any more questions? No more questions. As usual, you can send me your questions. If you want one-on-one -on -one coaching, if you want to have my full attention, just let me know and we can set that up. I wanted to point out a couple of sessions that are coming up with uh, Dr. Andy Cornish this week and Dr. Peter Hout next week, which are really about um, uh, um, conservation and understanding marine biology. So these two sessions really, really good for learning uh, not so much about photography, although Dr. Korn is also a very good photographer. Um, I have a lot more photography planned for you next week. We're doing Photoshop for beginners. So if you know Photoshop really well, I don't think it's a good session for you unless you want to see how I explain it. But essentially, I'm going to cover all the different elements. But I promise you that you will be able to understand Photoshop in one session. So um, join me for that. Uh, we're going to do macro photography in two weeks and wide angle photography in four weeks. And I am going to confirm several more photography guests this week. So uh, stay on the lookout for those so you can join those. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel um, because there's a lot of good stuff already there. Um, and yeah, we've got a Facebook page that you can follow and uh, Instagram that you can follow, etc. cetera. So uh, uh, link me up. And uh, of course, if you can share um, the, uh, any of the videos with your network, you're helping me a lot. Um, we also have a tip jar now, which, oh, sorry, I don't have the link. I'll send it in the email tomorrow, but we have a little tip jar. So if you want to tip us, there's like a fund me page. And uh, if you want to drop a couple of coins in there, that's appreciated. Um, and otherwise, I'd like to thank you for sticking with me for such a long time. I know I've overrun again, uh, but your interest uh, uh, ch uh, challenges and charms me. And so therefore, um, thanks for spending all that time.
Any other questions? If not, I would like to say good evening to everybody who's in Asia and a nice rest of the day in Europe and in America. Um, and yeah, wherever you are in the world, stay safe, stay uh, healthy, and hope we can all dive together soon. Have a nice evening and over and out. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.